Uh, without further ado, let's hear it for uh, Tony DiGiulio. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, been uh, running around. Rob asked me to speak tonight uh, about thinking how to think like an investor. And we're going to get into details about all that. We're going to skip through um, these slides in a way, hopefully, <laughs> like I said, a little too quickly sometimes. But we'll, we'll, get, some, we'll get some good uh, in-depth knowledge out of it. And I say, why do I speak on this topic from this point of view? And the point of view is, again, back to the foundation. Um, a lot of startups come, come out. They try to get up and running. But they really don't have a sense of where they are and where they need to go. And that is often, it's often overlooked because all the startups start coming out and then they say, let's just go. Let's just get things going. Let's, let's get it up and running. We'll go talk to investors and we'll get money. And uh, it doesn't work very well that way. I have experience of 20 years in business and five years in startup uh, investing and advising. I have um, been doing mostly high tech, and that's where I come from. I come from 20 years of selling systems and building systems for telecom network, literally worldwide, everything from Sing Singtel, Hong Kong Telecom, Telecom Italia, all over the world, Telecom Egypt, even Iran Telecom when we were supposedly not supposed to be selling to Iran. And that's when we started doing DSL systems back in the day. Uh, so I have a lot of product knowledge, a lot of technology knowledge, different things about how uh, to implement testing and certifications. Also around software. I worked for various software companies selling large software uh, solutions to telecoms, which are tens of millions of dollars and network monitoring systems and software also. Um, this is a quick run overview again, as I was saying. Startup founders tend to only be looking for quick answers. Um, they want a quick answer, a quick solution. Whenever I speak, no matter where it is, people always come up and ask me. Right at the end, they'll, they'll say, well, what about this? What about that? I just want to do this, or I want to do that. Just you know, in, in, you know, introduce me to investors, and they're not even you know, they're not even at any stage to even consider that. And it's a very, very, it's very disturbing when I see that because I feel sorry for a lot of the startups because they're jumping the gun and they're not taking their one step at a time approach. Um, and then we're going to talk into um, how to raise money. And also we'll go back here. Quick, whenever I say quick solutions always end up in quick failures. It's the law of life. And that's just a real, harsh reality. And then we'll talk about how to raise money, which investors to talk to, and how. We're going to go step by step through these as quickly as we can. So first and foremost, uh, as many of you know, if you're a startup, you've got to have a product, some sort of a product, whether it be a service, a software service online, whether it be a hardware product like a laptop, anything like that. The, the product has. It must have value. And again, we put this whole term into product being anything, a service, um, a software, an idea that you're trying to sell online. Things like that are actually real products. But what is the real value? Are people interested in it? Are people buying it? Is your product out to market? Those are some interesting uh, ideas to have as you go along. And we look at. The whole point about a product is that you're trying to create something that satisfies a need. And a lot of people don't realize that. And when you look at what they do and they're trying to create a product, let's say of just a regular software like an uh, Apple iOS product that people put out there and they wonder why nobody is buying it after they've developed all this. They put it up there on the Apple store and nobody's looking at it. Well, it's really not necessarily satisfying a need. It satisfies your need and maybe few people that you know, it makes them happy, makes them laugh or do whatever, but it's not a, an applicable satisfactory um, need. So when you're in a startup, you've got to think about those terms when you're going forward. What, what is the product? Where is it going to go? How is it going to work? And a lot of times, the product is just a beginning piece, right? Like Amazon, Amazon.com. 
I still remember the, their first website back in the day because I was really into books and when I was a student. They had this simple, basic little website and it was just selling books. That's all they did, or mainly for textbooks was their main driver. And now look at them today. Their product, what don't they do? Right? I mean, they do everything. And it's just one step at a time. But the product has been, it was very useful and attractive to investors and to and customers. So you want a, tr a product that you know is going to be worthwhile. But how do you know that when you're a startup? You actually don't. Even if you have the cure for cancer, you know, maybe, maybe the cure is, is painful and people aren't willing to go through it or it takes, you know, six months of horrific treatment. Who knows? We don't, we don't know that. And can you get the product out to market, right? So you never know when you're a startup. And this is an, an interesting idea or an interesting thought that a lot of companies, they start out with a product and they see that it doesn't have any traction and they get discouraged and throw it away. They get done with it. Think about that if you're a startup. If you're downtrodden right now, you're walking around and you're trying to figure out, reform your product. Find a different market, a different group, right? Think about how to get it out to the market in those terms. And when we start getting into the idea of product overall, your whole company, uh, you, you have to keep that open mind because I've seen some incredible things go down the drain because they just got frustrated. And they even had in investors interested. But they said, we've got no traction. We have nothing going on. And one of them, I'll, I'll tell you, well, yeah, I can tell you a little bit about it because <laughs> they're back now. This was about four years ago. They created a wireless application for wireless broadband. It was too early to market, but they didn't know that at the time. They were just trying to get the encryption right on it and everything else. They were trying to get it up and out to the world to do a wireless broadband ISP. There's a lot of entry to barriers there. But they put it into a city. They got it up and going, and it just kept failing, kept going. So they had to re-engineer and kept going back and forth. And at that point, everything just started coming along in wireless industry, faster and bigger and everything else. And they got kind of knocked off the shelf, and they just let it go. They just dropped it and said, forget it. That same technology now has been picked up by a couple of other people who knew this person. They're re-engineering it and bringing it back out to market. Very, and it's it doing very well right now in a lot of tests around the world right now. And you're going to see this being coming to market, I think, hopefully, uh, full feature in about three years, two to three years. And it's very different than anything else. So don't get discouraged if your product isn't immediate taking off or anything like that. It may have been too early. And it's very important to understand that because I joined, I started doing real high tech stuff like with uh, telecoms and networking when DSL first came out. It was a nightmare. It was unbelievable. All the technology that had to go into that, how to go out there and do, you know, deliver DSL technology, and it failed, it failed, it failed. It kept going on, it kept going on. It was impossible to do, it was too expensive, everything else. All the carriers pushed it aside. They said it's too much, it's not worth our hassle, at least here in the US. Over in Europe, they had a different mentality. And they said, we're going to make it work. And they did. And then it has just exploded in Europe before it came here to the US. And that was, again, there was a product. There was technology. There was a real need for it. And they knew that. And they just kept driving it and driving it and driving it. Um, and it was just, it was a nightmare. But it worked. And today, we have DSL or cable, simply because of that, because people wouldn't give up. So when you think about product and it, those ideas and everything else going on, you have to think about every single aspect. You know, is it software, hardware, as I just described, online services, licensing, support strategies? How are you going to build that all into your plan to encompass an attractive and attract investors? 
think your product through, right? Step by step, the design, the distribution, the market, the people involved in it, your team, how does your team tie into it? It's very, very important. And the investors, when they see something like that, they, they, they will sit there and watch, and they'll see what you're doing, even though the product may not be out to market. And investors will go, this is very interesting. Call us in a year or six months when, you're, when you actually have customers and you're going out and it's working, because I'll be the first investor. That happens all the time. If they see a solid line of execution on this, they see the thought process, right, into going into the product, and you're doing a step-by-step -step process just to develop that product, to make it attractive and useful, very important. Um, and when you're out there, you've got your product up and running. In fact, I was just speaking to somebody right before coming up here tonight. Um, they have a product right now. They have a service, a potential service, everything going on. They just don't have a lot of customers right now because this is a, a type of service or a type of product that if they throw it out there to attract customers, they could disturb their market and give away their secret out there. So you kind of, sometimes you get caught between a hard place and a rock there, right? And uh, you have to be careful about that. <clears throat> if your product, if it's not patentable, and you have to go out and get customers, you have to be aware that you could lose that market. Should you run away anyways? No. But if you have a product, make sure that you have a patent or you have some kind of a patent in process going on. Because if you go out there and you try to attract customers, you know, and you try to sell to them and so forth, you know, it's, it's the age old story, people always stealing other people's ideas. And investors, if your product is not patentable in one way or another, uh, it's, it's very hard to get money. I don't think any of you, even though you're a startup, you, you, you probably would not and probably should not invest in products that aren't patentable, whether it be a software, hardware, or a service, or anything like that. Or if there's even some sort of maybe a design patent. Design patents aren't very strong. They, uh, they're easily beatable, and people can copy them. And there's nothing you can do about it. But if you use some sort of way that you can wrap up that IP and then go out and get your customers, yeah, the investors are going to, that's what they're going to like, right? Uh, investors today don't invest in ideas. They invest in proof, in the proof of concept with your product, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know if any of you have been, done startups before. Um, but that's, that's always, always, always the case. And, you know, are you going to walk around and go out there and just try to attract customers, you know, for the hell of it? And just hopefully your product and your technology will take off without protecting yourself with a patent? Or <clears throat> you can protect yourself in other forms if you have a good attorney. Or, uh, he'll tell you, you know, he or she will tell you how to do that. But... Uh, without customers, it's going to be very hard to attract investors, bottom line. Unless you have a service, as I was talking with this person just a few minutes ago, their, their product, their service could be attractive to investors, and there could be an investor who is willing to put a very high-risk investment in that, that it's actually going to work, and say, okay, let's put it out there, you know, let's, uh, let's take care of it and try and test it and see what your customer retention is, what your customer attraction is, that's a, that's a very high risk. Remember, investments are all about risk, not the return. It's more important about measuring the risk. Um, even if you say, oh yeah, we can get you a 50% return on your investment, what's the risk involved with that? That's, those are the key factors right there, your return versus your risk in all, all uh, um, investing, no matter if it's a startup, or you're, you're investing in a private company uh, on the stock market. It's all the same, right? So when you're going through your product, you need to think about the investor and you're saying, okay, what is the investor's view? Does it fit in with their knowledge base and their experience? There are all types of investors, right? And they, 
you, you look at them. You look at all the VCs, and you even look at angel groups and various uh, what we call syndicates. And they say, oh, we only invest in hardware. We only invest in biotech. We only invest in company uh, ERP type of business software. So you need to know that. Um, you need to know the investors you're talking to, what their experience is, what's their knowledge base. Are they a good fit for your, for your product? Uh, like a friend of mine, he runs a group called uh, Dragon Innovation. And what they specialize in is small manufacturing capability and building special devices of hardware. iRobot. Anybody know iRobot? Those things? Yeah. So Scott, he, he created that. He's now a big time investor with companies like that. And he focuses directly on hardware. And it could be anything from uh, robotic devices to Fitbit and things like that. That's his knowledge base. That's what he invests in. Um, and that's what the, the product, when you get your product going, you need to follow these steps in such a way that you get, when you do that, then you can get to the investor, right? After you got your product, you have it going, you have it patented, you have customers, then you say, okay, now that we have this all up and running, let's go talk to the investors who know what this is all about. And then... If a lot of times investors, you have to also question. You go in there, you'll pitch to them, and they'll say, oh, this isn't any good, you know, or anything like that. Or they'll say, you need to do this, you need to do that, and come back and talk to us. Is their view right? Well, it may be. If you've been to 10 different investors and they tell you the same story, then most likely it's right, right? Because you go and you pitch to investors, they, they have a certain, shall we say, <laughs> a specific focus of what, how they're going to respond to you and what they're going to say. And that's exactly what that is. is it's their view. It's their own personal view from their own personal experiences. So you get through the whole product development, everything else, then you can go and say, hey, let's go talk to Andreessen Horowitz because I do a special online type of software. You know, let's go talk to Artemon because this is a white space type of investment, this product. Okay, so we're, we're going to jump now from the product. You've done all this time. You spent a lot of uh, development, designing, testing, so on and so forth. Now you have to jump into, for the investor's point of view, you know, they, they look at the product and they say, oh, this is a great idea. This is a great service. This is a great product. The product doesn't mean a damn thing if you don't have the team to deliver. This is the key. You will continually hear say, investors saying, we only invest in teams. We just invest in the team. That's our number one point of view. That's our number one view. That's, that's how we do it. That's, that's what it takes. They're partly right. I don't fully believe in that. Uh, I believe that it's a balance between the product, the team, and the execution. Now, we'll take a look at what, what this means. Um, does the team really matter? And absolutely it does. And the reason being is if you are a group of, let's say, engineers, and you're going to design something, and the three of you sit down and you say, oh, we can do X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 boom, 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 you do it. And then you get through the product, and you get to this point, and you say, huh, we need another engineer. <laughs> we don't know anything about this that we just discovered. So these are things to think about. You need to bring in another team member, right? An engineer uh, who's willing to work for free and help you guys get up and running, right? And so this is, it's a tricky battle um, because, as I just stated, teams are, are, are what the investors are really looking at and the execution capability of them. But if the product isn't sellable, if it's not marketable or anything like that, how is your team going to respond to trying to sell it? Right? They can't, they can't just give it away and hope people will pick it up. They can't just sell something that's broken. So in the, that's why the uh, investment world out there, they judge the teams in different ways. 
what is their ability. So when you come down to the team, right now, most of you in here, right, you're, you're the startups that are all about inexperienced people doing new things, right? You haven't done three or four startups and have exited them or have failed in one or another or gone IPO. So this is what investors are looking at. Well, okay, if you guys are a bunch of new people starting up a startup, what kind of risk is that? Well, it depends on many things. The product, what you're trying to do, is it in a market that's a high-risk market? And what are your capabilities, as I was just describing? That's what the investor looks at right there. It's risk, 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 the, the association of risk. So then, or do they look at, and are you a group of people who are experienced people in doing other startups? Have you, like I just said, have you exited, or do you have three startups right now that are up and running and doing very well? And when you can lay that out there and show the investors, oh man, they'll just, they'll just look at your PowerPoint presentation, they'll say, let's have a meeting, let's talk, let's, let's get serious. Uh, and it's very important when you are bringing your team together that you all have the same focus, and the same focus as the investors. And we'll get to that in a minute, and I'll explain why that is. And I say, how do the investors judge the, judge the team? What I just described, the past achievements. What have you done in the past? Doesn't mean you have to have been in a startup. You could have come from Cisco and done what Arista did, right? Those are all ex-Cisco employees. And they started a switch business. And they got funding in a New York second because of their past experiences and their knowledge. So then what is your current achievements? Right now, where are you right now with your startup? What are you doing? How are you doing it? Are you guys doing development right now? Are you doing business development? Are you doing product development? Are you executing? Do you have a plan and do you have every month? Do you follow an execution plan? These are big points for investors. If you can execute, 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 that shows you that you have a team that is very knowledgeable and capable. It's a comprehensive team is what I call that. That you're, you can do that and the investors will just say, hey, we love it. We know you guys aren't out to market. You have two customers, big deal. But you show us that you're able to do this. You know, we'll put in $200,000 right now to help you guys get more and more. Uh, and then if you guys execute on these particular plans, We'll put in another million and we'll just, we'll go to town on this. Very important. Well, that's why the team, um, the team aspect is uh, very important. And it's, you know, not all the time do teams get along. Um, but if everybody understands their job, what the focus is, what they have to do and where they have to go and when to get there, that's more important than getting along sometimes. And, uh, my friend's startup is exactly that. There are two people who, they're just hard to get along with. Uh, they're social skills, but they're not wrong. And man, when they act, they get things done like you wouldn't believe. And they, they do things in a very different way. I go, I, I would never have thought of that. So if you don't get along, make sure that they all, and everybody has the same focus. You all know what the end game is. Another thing, what is your knowledge base? If you guys are developing a, let's say, a online payment platform, <laughs> you know, do you guys have experience in the payment history of, you know, did you work at uh, Visa or American Express or a bank or anything like that? Those are important things to think about. And most of all, the thinking processes about the team. This is, this is very important. Is the team open-minded? So when an investor comes in and says, hey, this product could go also into this market, and you guys say, no, <laughs> we're only focusing on this market. This is all that we know. The investor's going to go, okay, that's a red flag. Or if the investor says, well, I don't, if you guys do this and do this and make the product do this, I think you guys could have a whole other market or you guys could have a whole new idea or something like that. So be willing, be open-minded to suggestions. It's the number one reason why investors, even people who walk in, 
with these great ideas, but they're so headstrong, right? They get in there, and they're like, yeah, whoo, we got the cure for cancer. Throw it down on the table, and the investor looks at it and goes, great, okay. What are you about this? And what about, no, no, no. When you have no's coming out of people's mouths, a string of them all the time, and I, and I saw this. It was very embarrassing for this investor, I mean, for the, uh, the client, and I just was sitting there just like, oh, my gosh. They, they're, not, they're not listening to advice. They're not willing to work with the, these guys. And the investor said, hey, we'd like to, we, we know a product manager that you guys could really use. We, we can put him in there. And they said, no, this is our team, this is our company, and so forth. And he just folded their, they gave him a very nice uh, PowerPoint, you know, PDF PowerPoint presentation in a nice leather case and all this, because they had a really solid product. He just closed it up and goes, have a nice day. And they tried to sit there and talk to him. He just got up and walked out. And he told the, the woman out there sitting outside, he goes, will you please show them out? It was that rude. But they were, they just didn't understand that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an art to have a conversation with, with investors. It really is. It's a technique. It's a style. And you, you have to learn from them where they are, what they're looking for, what they're doing. And in order to do that, you need to be open-minded. You need to sit down and just ask questions. And again, we're flexible. Same thing I just uh, discussed about that. If you're inflexible, um, it's not going to happen. And are you focused? Again, the team. Is the team completely focused on the end goal? Um, and again, it doesn't matter if you guys don't get along all perfect and smiley all the time. If you guys can execute and you have the end you have focused on what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to do it, then that's what the investor is going to be looking at. This is the reason why <clears throat> a lot of investors will ask you to write out a monthly plan. They'll say, OK, great. We're going to give you some money. but We want to see kind of like an, ex an execution plan, a project management plan, depending on what your product is, software development or whatever. And if you guys are focused, and I can tell right away if you're focused or not. And they'll, they'll look at the, how you're writing this out, what you're doing. And the investor will come back and say, yeah, we're a little scared about this because of this. What if we help you with somebody? You know, a lot of times investors will say, hey, we're going to introduce this person to help you out a little bit and get you guys better focused. And it's all about that, right? I mean, many of you have been through this <laughs> in life in general, regular jobs without a startup or whatever. You've been in companies that have not been focused. Yeah. I've been there, and it's, it's hell. It's ridiculous. Um, and it's, it's just because not everybody is really in the team, so to speak. Execute, the execution. This is so important. <laughs> everybody, you know, I keep telling you, the team, the product, make sure you get that laid out there and everything. The investors are only investing in the team. Well, the team, if they can execute, right, execution is everything. A lot of companies may not execute very well on developing a product or a service that's of high quality or is real solid, but they know how to market the hell out of it because they have these incredible marketing people and they execute and they execute. They go out, they get partnerships, they go to, do, go to marketing activities. They just start advertising, they start writing papers, they execute, they execute. And sometimes, you know, the engineers sit back there and they go, what are you guys doing? You know, you're, you're doing this, you're doing that. Uh, we're not up to speed with you. They said, don't worry about it. We're just getting the product out there. And that's a lot of what happens um, if you have the ability to have a so-so product. And this is true. A lot of startups might have just so-so products. And I've seen it. But they have a marketing team that's unbelievable. And they make it. They do all right. You know, they may not be making $20 million a year or whatever, but some are. But it doesn't matter. You know, that's the other thing. What, what are you guys looking for in your team? When you, I mean, in your company, when you go and you want to execute, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to be a unicorn? Are you guys just trying to achieve 20 to $30 million a year in sales? What makes you happy? That's very important because when you start talking to investors and they say, what is it? Why did you do this? Why, what, when you go forward, what are you going to be able to do to make yourself happy and keep people happy? 
And some investors don't care um, that you're not going to be able to sell your company. A lot of VC firms, that's their main thing, you know, exit or IPO. But it's based upon the execution of where everybody is going to be happy. Because if you're an investor, like a seed investor, and you throw $50,000 down in there, and then the company says to you, hey, uh, if you invest in us, we'll give you X return on your money. Sometimes there's um, contracts like that, right? We'll give you 10% annually or, or whatever, or 10% of earnings. Well, it's never 10%, but it's 2 to 3% usually, something like that. Well, some, some uh, investors are okay with that. And they say, okay, I'm, I'm guessing you guys are going to do about $20 million a year. And if you pay me, you know, what, 2 to 3% of that, I can live like that. I'm happy. Again, that's where they, they're tying into that. The execution that I'm talking about here is when you execute, what are you trying to achieve? Is it your own happiness? Are you just trying to achieve the happiness of the investor? Or are you trying to get your company to a certain place? This is what investors will ask you, and they'll ask you a little trick question sometimes, too, to see what your real execution capability is to get where you want to go and where they want to go, too. So, you know, you could be the greatest engineers on the planet, but if you can't work with other engineers and you can't get that product up and ready in time, it's a big problem, right? So you can't ex you just can't execute that. And now, when when the investors look at this, here, the investors' point of view for this all comes from their point of view comes from their past experience. How many companies have they invested in you know, over the last four or five years? And they look at yours and they say, okay, you guys need to execute in such a way because this is what all of my other investments have told me. This is what I've done. I've been very successful, they say, in all these investments and you guys need to do that, right? So that's how the investor knows whether you guys can execute. It may be because they also have been in your position they also have had jobs at various companies, right? That they have had to go through all these execution processes, they've had to get product out to market, and so forth. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Martin Casado. Anybody here know Martin Casado? Never hear of uh, NYSERA, SDN software, that VMware bot? Wow. <laughs> so that was his whole thing, yeah. So, he did his whole PhD at Stanford on SDN network um, and started his company, NYSERA. The only way that he was able to become uh, very successful in the way that he was was his company. He knew from the beginning, because of all his research and everything, being a PhD student, what execution was all about. He got out, he started his company, and boom, he sold it to uh, VMware for a little over $1 billion. And he had investors, and they knew that he could do it because of his history. And because of one of the investors that invested in him um, also knew from previous experiences of other software companies, and he himself had experience being a software developer. So that's where the investor really knew uh, what was going on, how it was to be done. Uh, and Martin's just a very sharp individual. Um, so when the investor looks at this, you know, ha has your startup executed on current tasks? Here's a thing that you need to think about when you're doing a startup. Keep a log of what you guys set out to do, how you did it, and everything like that. Because if you can go to an investor and show them, hey, for the past two years, this is what we've done. We've just, you know, we've been shooting from the hip, learning along the way, and everything else. Investors love that. They love to see that you have a thoughtful process and that you are able to execute simply because you wrote it out, you followed the plan, and you made it happen. Sometimes it's not that hard, right? And it's very, very important to understand the relationship between execution and having a great product and getting it out to market because there's a lot involved there, and we all know that. There's a lot of little steps. Um, when we start looking at 
early stage investors, we're talking seed and aim, what I call seed and angels, anywhere from 50,000 on up to 500,000. There's a certain range of investors, 500,000 to 1 million seed to angel investors. Um, and I'm, I'm a big fan of investors who put the money, give you the money, and they'll say, what a lot of times what they do is they create a fund. They get their lawyers together, everybody gets their lawyers, and they create a fund. And they put a $350,000 in there. And they start doing this task-oriented or goal-oriented financing. That means, okay, we're going to give you $100,000 up front, and in three months we're going to give you another $100,000 if you accomplish these goals, these tasks. If you as a startup, you go right into the investor and you say, hey, we're willing to do this. You just say, hey, we're also willing to be flexible on how we acquire our money. Oh my gosh, the investors go, holy smokes, are you serious? And it's a, it's a new form of investing, not really that new, but in certain aspects now for, because there's so many investors out there now, right? I mean, on every corner who have a lot of money. Uh, and again, this alleviates risk. And if you guys are open-minded, flexible, and willing to go in, TOF task-oriented and goal-oriented financing. Yeah. <laughs> and so you, can, you guys can set up your plans to complete certain tasks. You say, hey, we need to develop this JavaScript and have it up and running in three months. Bingo. You know, or you have other ones. You say, we need to bring in five customers in this certain area, we're going to reach out, contact them, get them up and going, boom, like that. And I keep, and I really do uh, hit on this point, that if you are really smart, you will encourage this type yourselves. Um, because it attracts investors a little better um, when you're down at the other end, shall we say, of your initial startup investing, early stage funding, and so forth. And it really, really helps to take the risk or soften the risk for the investors. And it also forces you to be a better participant in your own company. Because you're, you're now forcing yourself to follow a, 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 a task oriented. You saying evaluate or evaluate? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying. Like, no. So uh, let me explain that. So, like I said, when you let's say the investors get together and they say, "Okay, here's three hundred fifty thousand." that we're just going to put into your company right now, okay? The company doesn't necessarily have to have a valuation of, let's say it's worth $2 million, because it may actually not be worth, you know, that much, or it may only be worth 500000 right? But the investors believe that if you follow these steps and you execute this, the company will possibly be worth three to $5 million after that, right? So what you do is you set it up and you say, okay, you sit down with the investors and you lay out your table and you say, we need this much money every single month just to, you know, to get by and to get things done. Because some of these, uh, some of these tasks or these goals are going to require investment, uh, maybe in hardware, software, or whatever, or bringing another person in and things like that. So the investor will say, okay, here's $100,000 to get you up and going. Now you have $250,000 left. This month here, if you get these tasks done, we'll, put, we'll give you another 100000 and so forth. You can do it in increment, whatever you guys agree on. Okay. Uh, that's uh, that's most, most of the time up front, yeah. So the investor, because you're, what are you going to invest in, right? I mean, if you give $350,000 into the company, and you've got to have some kind of a guesstimate on a valuation. Um, and you can say, okay, well, for 350000 a lot of times when you're a very early stage startup, we'll say, okay, we're just going to give you 3% uh, of the company or whatever. You know, they, there's a lot of guesstimates. And that's either done by, the, it depends on who the investor is. If the investor is a person that you know, it's like friends and family, 
or maybe a seed investor or a group of people, they have to agree on the valuation, right? And nobody, and if you don't know, like you say, if we're going through and we're doing these different tasks, and because there's two stages here. If we go through and we say, okay, this is a product that's not out to market yet, but the companies, these investors say, hey, this product is really cool. This idea is really cool. We see the market traction. We know that this will work, okay? You can't put a valuation on a company like that. It's very hard. It takes a very specialized valuation expert to do that, and you have to hire somebody to do that in that sense. But if you have investors who are smart and you have attorneys that get together and you guys can say, okay, right now there's no value in the company because we don't have any product going out there. But if you put in this amount of money, you're going to get a percentage of the company. That happens, you know, you'd be surprised at how that happens a lot. You know, a lot of times people will say, for $350,000, let's just say I'm making up a number, you're going to get 5% of the company. Okay? Or, Well, that, that all depends on how the contract is written. You see this? So there's a way to look at that. Um, if an investor invests in an early stage startup and so on and so forth, like we're just talking specifically that the company isn't out there, doesn't have any customers, the product is a great idea, and they have, some, they have some proof that it actually works or whatever, they start doing that. So when you say an investor is given, let's say, 25% of the company, but let's say they go down and they get to this point and they say, oh, my gosh, it's not actually working very well. Does the investor have the right to pull out? You bet you, yeah. All, all investors are going to have the ability to exit at any time. You know, that's what all, all contracts say. Now, they pull out, they lose their money, right? They've already paid out, let's say, $150,000. They're not going to recover. This, that's part of the contracts, too, if you have a smart lawyers on both sides. That's an investment. That's a risk, right? It's like losing money in the stock market. That $150,000 is done. It's gone. It's used up. Nothing they can do to get that back. If there is money left over in the, in the fund, let's say they put a trust fund together or whatever to pull money out of for this company, okay, you have to have a contract stipulating that if X, Y, and Z conditions are not met, you have the right to pull your money back that's left over. Yes, absolutely. That's why it's a lot of times it's set aside in a different fund to protect everybody. Oh, absolutely. As soon as, the, as soon as the investors exit, they have nothing. They have no claim, right? In that type of a, in that type of a scenario, so the investors, you know, this is a, this is a company that's not, doesn't have a real solid valuation or they, they made up the valuation, right? They just put this together. If you have a fund set aside, and this is a special fund where it's protected money so that only the investors uh, can touch this, right, and the attorneys, and they can allocate this money out. So if the, if the product goes along and all of a sudden it doesn't work, let's say there's $200,000 left over, that money comes out of there, goes back to the investors. No, the equity, they, they lose it. They lose, they lose, yeah, as soon as they pull their money out, this is, again, depending on the contract, as soon as they pull their money out, that's saying we're exiting, we're done, we've spent our money, it's a high-risk investment, we now can raise it as a tax write-off basically what happens. No, they're not allowed to. Usually they're not allowed to. They're, you know, I'm, there's so many, stri so many sticky, stri tricky contracts out there. As soon as they pull their money out of that fund, that means they're exiting. Yeah, and that means everything goes back to the startup. So the startup has to start over, like in that particular case, the product isn't working. Okay, so now they have to regroup, redo a bunch of things, and maybe in six months to a year, they're going to be able to go back out and ask for money again. So. No, just the investors. Just the investors. You can still keep the company name, okay, and so forth. You can still do all of that. The investors don't have any claim to the company's name. I have
No, because in, when you have, that's what I was saying, you've got to have good lawyers. In that, if, the, if everything is going well, it's all because you have guidelines. The investor are not going to pull out. They don't have the right to take that money out if the company meets those goals, right? Wait, wait, you're an investor or? Oh, oh. And so you're saying you want to leave. No, nothing you can do about that. That's part of the contract. The investors, the investors have uh, a stake in your company, right? They are now, they are now the preferred stock, right? Stock owner. That's, that's, that's why you have the attorneys. So you monitor, you have the goals, you have these achievement tasks, right? Those are all monitored by the company, by the investors, and the attorneys handle all that legally. There's no way for anybody to get, you know, to try and screw each other over or anything like that because of that. Con that's why you put that money in that safe, okay? That's why you put it in a special fund that allocates it out there like that, and the contracts will state all goals are going to be done X, Y, and Z. Uh, nobody can pull out as long as these are being met. Nobody has the right to pull out, except for there are in contracts. If somebody comes into financial hardship, like one of the investors, and says, hey, I, gotta, I need my cash back, something like that, then there will be a reshuffling sometimes, but they'll be able to get money from other investors. Yeah. Yes. No, no. As soon as the investors pull the money out, it, the whole deal is done. Yeah, it's, it's done. That's how, if you're a smart attorney on either side, uh, if you have a smart attorney for your startup, you'll make sure that they, you're, you're fully protected. Okay? That's why these funds are set up, because they are special funds that nobody is, you know, you have to have, you have very specific guidelines to. Okay? And it's very hard for anybody to grab the money and run or to get, take the money and say, hey, we're done with this. Uh, we're not going to do anything like that. You can't say that because what you've done is you set yourself up as an investor. You said, okay, if goal A is reached, if goal B is reached, and so on and so forth, we pay out. Also, if these goals are continuously met, we will stay in the investment. That is part of the contract if you're smart. Okay. Also, because they are early investors and because they set up that fund, you also want to, even, even at this point, you want to state that you are going to have priority privilege as an investor um, to buy in at a discount price later on. That's a pay to play or, you know, or um, the other option where, you, you know, that's what you want to put in there too. No, it's, it's the, you, you're saying that if they put it, they put it, they put a certain amount of money into this fund, okay? They can't pull that money out no matter what, as long as these goals are being met. As soon as these goals are not being met or the product is a failure or something like that or something adverse effect, they can pull the money out and say, we're done. And they return the equity. They're done with the company, yes. Unless there's, okay. <laughs> There are special cases where they can hold on to that stock equity, like I said, in an adverse effect. If one of the founders in that company, let's say, has been discovered to be a major Coke dealer, well, guess what? These investors have the right to kick him out. He's going to go to jail. They have the right to the IP. That's if that contract is set up properly. So because that company is now just being slammed by the media, they, everything went down, these investors have the right to the IP. Intellectual property. And one of the investors wants to back off. So how, how does it work? Can't. From, from the trustee fund? Can't. Okay. You're going to be a smart startup. You're going to make sure they're locked in. Okay. Yeah. 
The only time, the only time that anybody, any investor can get out, again, is if by law in this California, is if they're having really financial difficulties and they need to recover that uh, for emergency, like if they're filing for yeah. bankruptcy or Something they, like emergency, yeah, any yeah. certain circumstances like that. Other than that, they're locked in. And as long as that lock-in uh, comes up to, you know, you, if your company is doing all these things, they don't have the right. That's a contract, so you got to, but we'll discuss that in a minute. Okay, okay. well, I'll, I'll right. continue on some more. Let's, uh, so the execution now. Anybody here know the TV show, Silicon Valley? How many people? Yeah, every single one of you sitting in here had better be watching this show. It's a classic, okay? It is the epitome of Silicon Valley. They nailed it. There's nothing, there's no better show that shows this. And they show a lot of this. What, what are they doing the whole time? They're executing. They're nailing it. They've got it going. They're boom, boom. They sit down, they schedule it all out, right? And they know what they need to do. And then they shift and they go, wait, this, this company, our competition is doing this now. They're trying to steal it. Let's do a different product, you know? They're, they're always executing, right? And they got this great product. And then they show, uh, what's his name, the major investment guy you know, in Silicon Valley investing in them and everything like that. And that's what it's all about. It's all about execution. <laughs> it's, very, it's very interesting, all the stuff you can learn from watching that show. And it's, it's, it's just, it's a total comedy, but there's, a, there's so much truth in it. Oh yeah, that's tomorrow. <laughs> Jeff Faust is a valuation expert, and he'll be speaking tomorrow at InnoWest. Rob can tell you more about that if you guys are looking for that. Um, and again, I'm going to run through this real quick about valuation when we're talking about investment here and about the product and everything else. When you're going in and you're shopping for money, you will be required to do a valuation, whether it be done just by the investment people who are doing it um, <clears throat> or whomever. Or, but you, in my personal opinion, Get the valuation done by them, and also hire your own valuation person. It's, it's, it's really not much money. It's like uh, two to three thousand uh, dollars for a simple valuation. Since most of you are just simple startups and everything like that, the valuations are inexpensive. Um, and Jeff Faust's company, uh, Abbott and Lynch, that's what they specialize in. And the reason why you want to get that one done, and you want to have the investors do their own, is to compare them. And you want to protect yourself because you don't want an overvaluation. It's one of the worst things that you can do. And I'll explain that. So the valuation, why do we have them done? Because of the point of view from a Series A or an angel, different valuations for different, uh, different strategies if you're an investor. Exit price, you know, are you going to do a valuation based on a possible exit price? Things like that. These are some things that I'm throwing up here just to think about uh, when, you, when you're dealing with your startup. And again, how is the valuation done? First and foremost, it has to do with the market. If you're a biotech company and you've come out with a new uh, pill that gets rid of the flu, okay, great. That's worth a lot of money, right? You know, instead of getting a flu shot or something like that. But if you take this just once, I don't know, it'll cure the flu forever. So they have to go in, they have to look at all their companies who are doing similar things. You guys know the procedures. Um, what is the market status of your type of product? Um, are you going to be another Snapchat? Snapchat is, you know, in the process of coming out with a new product, Spectacles. That value is going up. What can you do similar to theirs? These are the things that they all look at. What is the real value of your company uh, in terms of that? The product. How disruptive is it? Product doesn't necessarily have to be very disruptive. Of course, that's what all the VCs are looking for. They're looking for real disruptive stuff that can, can really push out other competitors. Okay, excuse me. But your product doesn't have to be that disruptive, to be very honest. You can create something like Arista. Arista went in, they did another switch. They just copied, they literally copied Cisco's technology, right? Made it a little better. And they're selling switches with against Brocade, against Cisco, and everybody else. They just knew how to do it. You don't have to be that disruptive. So don't, don't think that you have to over-engineer your product, overthink everything going down the line. Think about your product 
and how disruptive you can be based on how you sell it in the market or how you apply it to the market. That's the disruption that's very important. Your current sales, of course, that's you know your valuation. Do you have any current sales? If you don't, it's uh, all valuations are made up. I'm going to be honest with you right up front. If you don't have any, it's very hard to do a real valuation because if you don't have current sales and you have a great idea and you have a product that actually works and you don't want to show the world yet and you're talking to the investors and saying we got to keep this quiet for this, well, how do you how do you judge that value? It's very hard. Um, of course, the team is part of the valuation. And the pitfalls of valuation, down rounds. You go in and you guys are so excited, you get valued at $5 million. After two years, you only, you only have $3 million in sales. Might not be very good. Or it could be a good thing that we have $3 million after a couple of years in sales. But then the down round comes around. And you've got to go shop for more money. Company's not worth five million, right? It's it could be worth five million at that point when you go for your second round, but that means it didn't move up in value. So investors are gonna they're gonna come at you and say, We're not investing in this, you guys haven't executed, or the product isn't applicable to the market or whatever. Where you might have some investors say, This is a, we know how to make this thing go to market. So you're gonna get a bad deal uh, on your investment on the next round, let's say like a VC type of thing. And they're, the reason why they're going to be able to tell you that, because you need the money and because it's a very high risk. And if they see a big return on that, um, then they'll, they'll, they will invest in that, okay? Oh, the pitfalls, again, the founders and investors are not in sync for the return on the investment. And that is that maybe the founders change their way along the way. They don't want to exit anymore. They want to continue on. They don't want to try to sell. They want to continue on to a uh, IPO. And the investors are all going, no, no. We're, we want to sell this thing right now and get a return on our investment. So a lot of, uh, there's a lot of battles like that that go on. Okay, I'll get your question. Um, I know it's question Q&A time, but we have something that's very, a couple slides that are important here. Let's wrap it up and let's get to Q&A. Okay. Um, here's the process of when you f pitching and raising money. Number one, that red highlight up there, you must have the foundation that we talked about all of this to shop for money. Don't waste your time, don't waste my time, don't waste investors' time or anybody's time if you don't have that whole foundation stuff we talked about, okay? Also, understand, do your homework when you go out and look at for, for investors. Again, go look on their websites, what kind of companies do they invest in, so on and so forth. What, what round are you in? Are you in an early stage? Are you, a, are you guys have a product even though you don't have any investment money but you're doing really well? Well, you're probably a venture capital firm possible sell on that. You know, it's just, you need to understand those. Um, and match your needs with the investment type. You know, don't go out there shopping for $5 million when you really only need uh, one and a half. And let's say you need one and a half. I wouldn't push anything beyond three. Always try to get a little more money than what you actually need. Cushion, right? Also, in certain types of investments, investors want to see that you're asking for more money. Yeah, a lot of people undersell themselves. So, and then how do you know which type you are? Again, we're talking about early stage uh, angel investing for products, for companies that are just up and running, up and going, stuff like that. If you have two million, three million in sales, you guys are real struggling with money. You could be a venture capital time. Okay, so these are th you need to. Yeah, let me. We'll get to that in a minute. Let me let me, let me finish that. Um, pitching and raising. You've got to have a comprehensive PowerPoint, PDF, so on and so forth that explains as much in detail. Okay. Um, and leave the detailed technical stuff for last. I get PowerPoints sent to me, and they, they, they're talking about all this technical stuff, and I say, okay, that's great, that's great. What does this thing do? How does it work? What is, it, what is the problem that you're solving, right? How does it apply to the market? So leave that to last. So, and again and again and again, open-minded, positive attitude, flexible, willingness to change and to 
willingness to listen to alternatives. This is very important. And again, you are selling an investment in yourselves and an idea. Sell your story yeah, and make that idea come alive. Get out there and be excited about it. Talk about it, okay? And know what you're talking about. And understand, do your research. There's so much information out there. Nobody here should be going in and talking to investors or doing any kind of a startup with questions that are so simple because the, there's, everything is out there nowadays. Um, these are examples of companies, but I'll, we'll do question and answer, and I'll explain some of these uh, if you guys want me to. I have uh, all these examples of the in investments and talking to them and things like that, all the way from Uber, different stuff. So but let's do some questions, questions and answers first. As Rob let's hear that. First of all, let's hear it for Tony and his yeah. presentation. So, thank you. So, so by the thank way, you. if you want the slides, uh, email Tony directly, and they'll also be incorporated into the video, which will be available on our YouTube channel in a few weeks. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and uh, we'll go around with the mic. Hang on to the mic and uh, complete your question, because you may have a follow-up before you give up the mic. So uh, first question here. Stand up. Hi. Uh, I have a question about uh, the funding you mentioned. So uh, there's a company called Magic Leap, right? Um, and it has got $700 million funding, and nobody has seen the product yet. Uh, and people keep talking about it, it's promising this and that. But so I kind of wonder what, what are your insights about that high evaluation uh, so early in the stage? That's an inside deal. So the investors who are involved with that and everything, they know the people, they know what's going on, they know the value. Again, they could be protecting a patent, mm -hmm. okay, or they could be applying. They don't want to get it out there. Like you say, it's not out there yet, it's not it's shown, and it may be. Um, when you hear money that big, this is a solid product, okay? Plus, everybody's connected somehow in a very special way when you talk about $700 million. And it may be that this is a group of, are they previous uh, startup people? You know? I think it was, it got some Google money. Okay. Money from Google, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, many of you know Google has an incubation type of system, and it could be that. And so they are, you know, it could be, these guys all talk to each other because when you're talking Google investors, you're talking Stanford University, there's an investment group there and everybody's connected and so on and so forth. And maybe they're, they're protecting everything right now and they're getting ready for something special. I don't know. Uh, but when you, yeah, when you talk about early, early stage, when you say early stage, um, and that's just because we don't know what it is, right? We don't see customers or anything like that, but there's something special with the uh, IP and the patent. And it may be that, that they are locking in that patent, that they're maybe developing some more things. Okay. That's a lot. That's, you know, I don't know about the deal, so those are just my guesstimates. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So how do you find the right investor for your product? If your product is, like, so unique, it doesn't exist, it's revolutionary, so nobody has made that product yet in the market? So how do you go at the uh, investors who have never invested in that kind of a product before? Okay, so first of all, uh, that's a very good question and why we're all here talking about that. Um, you need to find investors. And first of all, you, like you say, it's a new product. It's not out to market or anything like that. You don't have customers. So we're talking early seed stage is where you need to start looking in angel investment groups. Right. There are angel investment groups all over the Silicon Valley, right? There's four or five of them uh, that I know about that I work with and do things with. So that's how you get started. Or you, you talk to people like me um, who will say, okay, I can introduce you. I can help you put things together. I can tell you whether you're, where you're at, uh, if, it's, you know, if you're able to pitch yet, and so on and so forth. Or you can even do your research and go out on to look at the VCs. Go out and look at or any, any investment group, even, even in some of the angels. Some of the angel groups don't list their investments. They're quiet, they're private, and they don't do much. But go and look at similar investments. If there's something similar to what you're looking at, uh, where does it fit in the market? What does it exactly do? So you can go on, you can go on Andreessen Horowitz and see what they invest in. You can go on to Lightspeed. You can go on to Artemon, whatever, uh, and see where they invest and see what the best fit might be. Um, yeah, just, oh, 
Um, but that's the thing. You've got to do your research. And if you, you know, do you have an attorney that's working with you right now? I do. Okay. So ask um, him or her uh, what, you know, what they, th if they're connected. A lot of times, um, like a couple of attorneys that I work with, they're very strictly connected to startups and to the startup community. And so they feed the system through that. So find out through that. Ask your attorney and say, this is this. I mean, do you know of anybody that knows of any, anything like this? Uh, and there, there are different attorneys that do that again and again and again. I stress the attorney part so much because I've seen so many companies just go on the wayside, um, being wiped out from other companies illegally and stuff. So I'm glad to hear that. But if it's, you know, that's the thing. You need, it's all about doing, you know, it takes time. But the thing is, is when you reach out to the investor, you don't have the contacts yet, hmm. right? So again, that's where people like myself come in handy, uh, where you just, you know, if you try to send an email to people at the VC firms, they won't even respond, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. It's not worth their time. They're so that's overwhelmed actually, with everything else. Yeah, so this is what actually happened. So initially, people asked me to go for a seed or angel investor to fund the project initially. But again, when I started explaining the product, so it kind of be needs a large amount of investment because it has something to do with consumer electronics, getting manufactured overseas and supply chain and all that stuff and FTC approvals. So a lot of yeah. process involved in it. So eventually they said to go to the big VCs where they have a larger potential. Um, again, I tried to reach out all the big VCs as well, KPCB too, but again, they don't respond for the right, most part. Right. So it's a process in place. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So talk to me afterwards. Okay. We'll see. Because if you said you had FCC, you had to get FCC approved. FTC. Yeah, so that's uh, what? Federal Trade Commission. Oh, FTC. Okay, yeah. okay. Sure. Hey, Greg. Uh, hi, Tony. Um, how, do you need to be concerned about approaching angel, angel invest, investment groups that have invested in competitive solutions or similar solutions in that maybe they'll share this new concept or idea with their, uh, with their current investment? Um, or do you feel that it's still safe to approach those groups and, and um, present your business? Try to avoid them if, okay. at first if you can. Uh, but again, we're talking about angel investors who invested in something similar. So right. they could say, oh, this might even be a better investment. This is, this is true. This is what happens. They'll go, oh, okay, this is something that's even a little better. Uh, or that could go side to side. We have similar products. But you know, what, are, what are investors doing? They're hedging their bets, right? They're not just going in and going one here, one there. They're going to go in and get a bunch of different investments. And you know, when they see the market after a year or so going down or going up for those particular investments, they're going to say, OK, we need to stop investing in this type, or we need to start going out. Because what are investors, what are VCs and investors? They're running a fund. There's a fund above them that all these multimillionaires are dumping in money, right? Billionaires and millionaires. And so they got to earn a return on that investment. And so they're, they're playing the numbers game. So and maybe we should consider how big their fund is, how many investments they take on. Um, whenever I see an angel in group and I, I say, well, they invested in something in the same space as me and we have a better conceptual solution, I get excited, but then I, I think to myself, well, I don't want to just be passing this on so to the other business. That's so. the thing. So if they're in the same space, I would, yeah, I would consider approaching them. Mm -hmm. um, and even mention that to them. Say, you guys are in the same space, but are they, is that other company that you know of that they invested in, are they a direct competitor of yours? Right. Okay. If they are a, a direct competitor, those investors will not invest in you. And okay. it's uh, because of legal issues. They've, the investors could actually be sued for this sometimes. But also the big problem is that investors never sign NDAs. Yeah. Yeah. No, nobody signs an NDA. And it's... Uh, it's, yeah. No, you go to any VC firm, no NDAs. Nobody, no, they don't want to sign them because it's a liability. Yeah. Never, never have I seen an NDA. Like in a startup that I was in back in 2000, 99 and 2000, when we went out to investors, that's where I learned about that. An investor says, we don't sign NDAs. And I went, so you got to be kidding me. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, hang on. Okay, sorry about it. Uh, like, in a law of your firm, you know, we got an intentional, you know, something, and they, you know, send me a letter, 
like we will sign together and they say you know uh, it's something happens like this blah 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 but we are not so it occurred probably so I said not to work with them so probably similar situation like they don't like NDA like yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's too much of a it's a, too much of a uh, liability for them to carry because anybody can go to them and then say, oh, we spoke to them six months ago about this product, our product, and they just invested in our competitor, right? So they shared information on that. I mean, that's a huge legal hassle right there. I mean, they're going to spend a million dollars in just in legal costs right there to defend themselves. Yeah, yeah, it happens. So yeah. nobody. The only thing you have NDA for, as many of you know, is just regular business transactions and when you're trying to create partnerships or sharing stuff. So. Maybe I, I'm, I'm going to remind you, could you open more seat, Angel, you know, how it works, the stages, you know, what's the, is it about the menu of uh, the, uh, you know, money amount or the stages, like the product is finished, you know, you know okay. if you open the... the so you want me to explain more of what a seed is here? Give, give him the help. Of what a seed. Okay, so in early stage startups investing, there's a, there's a seed and angel... Um, investing. There's also things called friends and family, the FF group, right? Um, so again, there's, there, it used to be that angel investors were put into this bracket of X amount of dollars, anything from 500000 to a million dollars. Angel investors are going all the way down to $100,000. Angel investment groups, you know, and, and smaller. Seed. Seed's going all the way up to a million dollars now. And that's because of angel.co, that's because of, you know, Kickstarter, there's all these different ways to raise money now. So if you go out there and you go, let's say, on Kickstarter and you say, hey, we're, we never raised money before, we got this going on, and so on and so forth. Um, and I just saw that, it was $675,000 these guys raised in two months for this really cool project they were working on. And do you call that a seed stage? What do you call that, Right. So these, you know, everybody wants to be worried about the, the definitions of seed and angel. Don't, don't worry about that. The seed tends to be smaller amounts. You know, we're talking, you know, 25,000 to maybe 200,000 is usually a, a rough range. Angels can be anywhere from 100,000 to a million, uh, stuff like that. Now, if you also have, there's another thing called um, angel investment funds and stuff like that. They've actually gone up to, I've seen them to $5 million and so forth. And those are, um, I just forgot, to, what do you call that when there's a group of investors? No, no, a sync, a syndicate, thank you. I'm trying to think synchronization. A syndicate. And I've seen that up to $5 million. So it varies. I mean, there's anything, it's so flexible nowadays. Because there are so many individuals out there, so many people with lots of money who are just willing to toss it around and take chances. Any questions on that side of the room? Well, there's no questions, questions on that over side. There? No. All right. All right. The side of the room here. Here we go. So if you're a startup, you're self-funded, uh, you don't need the money. Uh, you have traction. You have revenue. The revenue is growing. Uh, what's the justification to bring in angel or seed investments, given that what I've noticed is that VCs have a funnel, is a funnel that starts with angel and seed, and they like to see companies that have already been funded right. by Angel and Seed. Right. So does that mean if you don't need the money from Angel and Seed investors, are you going to have a challenge raising Series A no. later on? No, no, not necessarily. Again, um, just like what she mentioned back there, brand new company, they haven't even sold anything or done anything that we know of, right? $700 million, right? And that's, they haven't had any, but that's because they have very special technology, a special product. IP and stuff. So as you're saying, if you have, like I always say, if you have products going on and you have customers and you can show that the, um, there's a strong value in that and you, you're going to continue on with that, yeah, why, why wouldn't an angel investor invest in you? No. Okay. I mean, I'm I mean a, a VC. I yeah, mean, a VC. Right why, why, why wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah. That's the thing. Again, we're talking about there are so many VCs out there and the VCs are also becoming more and more uh, flexible in one sense, but at the same time, they're also becoming guarded. If you look at the amount of seed money that, I mean, um, angel and seed money that's being invested right now, it's just it's screaming. VCs are kind of flatlining because they, there's been a lot of loss. Uh, 
uh, but in certain things. But you, you know, if you have a product, a solid product, and you say, hey, I need two to three million dollars to take this to the next level, and look what I've already done. I've already brought in a million or two million dollars in revenue, but I really need a big hitter behind me to support me and do that. If you can sell that, then why, why not? Why not take that chance, right? Okay. Yeah. And so once but, you get to the point. Here's the question you need to ask yourself. Why would you rather do that and not do an angel investor? So that's, because I don't need the money. Then, then why would you even go to the VCs? No, eventually. Oh, right? eventually. So, that's so what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I mean, at some point to scale, yeah. you, you need the money. You definitely need the money, right? right? But if, if you have revenue, the revenue is growing, you can show growth, you can show traction. You can, why would you want the money if you can still fund it yourself and grow the valuation? Right, exactly. Right? So, yeah, so. exactly. That's one of the key points that I like to bring up, too. If you're a startup, uh, don't just do you start doing your startup. Don't start doing all this and quit your job, okay? Make sure that you have a product and everything that's viable, that you can actually go out and start pitching for money, raising money and stuff like that. Or if you have enough money that you can leave your job for a year, that's okay. But uh, shopping for money, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very disheartening prospect. <laughs> it's frustrating, you know, so... And if you're in that position where you can make money, where you're already a startup and you're making money, don't be in a hurry to get money unless you say, hey, I really need a million dollars, you know, because I see some stuff happening out there in the market and I need to really explode. Then, yeah, at, at yeah. some point, your cost is going to grow. I mean, yeah. the revenue exactly. comes with cost right. as well. There is cost component associated with it. The other question is once you get to the point where you need a Series A and you're across multiple industries, so... For example, if you look at Airbnb, it's hospitality and technology, right? So do they raise money from technology VCs or from VCs with, with hospitality domain knowledge? It's, well, it's a tech. It's tech, really, is what it is. It's, it's, so yeah. so you just, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, Airbnb is, if you look at their site, see who they're funded by and everything like that, um, you know, you'll, you'll see who it is. Okay. You know, if you look up the investors on them. And Airbnb is the reason why they list it as tech. It's, a, it's just basically a software as a service kind of a model that they have, right? Kind of going, it's kind of like an Uber. Uber is a tech, is really a tech company. And, and they started with a tech incubator yeah. anyways, right? Yeah. So that's the other question is, do you need an incubator? Is there, again, you don't need the money. No. You don't, there is, no. yeah. No, incubators are, you know, very specific. If people just, you know, a lot of times incubators are used um, to, for people who really don't understand maybe how to do everything properly, they go into the incubator and the incubator becomes, you know, well, you have to apply to get into an incubator and you have to go through the process. And so that incubator is going to help lift you up. You know, if you, and it works out pretty well. You know, but, you know, if you don't need that, then don't, don't worry about it. Well, you get us, get them, in, get the VCs engaged at an early stage just so that they know what you're up yeah. to. Like I was right. saying so, yeah. before. Yeah. Um, you know, start talking to VCs or whatever if you want. As long as you have everything taken care of, all this, the foundation laid out there, and then just say, hey, um, start a relationship. That's what it's all about. It's really, that's what it's really about, starting your relationship. And then you say to them, well, you know, I could mean maybe need some money in about a year from now. Yeah, okay. yeah they like that. They like that. All right, maybe we have time for uh, maybe a couple of quick questions, a couple of quick answers, and we'll take the rest of it offline. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, stand up. Hello. Um, to help us understand, as you as, as an investor, as a seed investor, how do you choose uh, which company are going to be able to, to pitch to you or something? How, how do you, you, you hear every pitch, you contact every person who wants to pitch you your, his idea or you have, just to understand how, how you, how you filtrate uh, everything you, you got, everything yeah. you come to you. Yeah, so uh, that's, a very, that's a very good question. And again, it goes back to what type, of, uh, <clears throat> what type of investment is it? What type of company? What are you doing? What is the technology? What is the product? Suppose it, so, it, it's for you. Yeah, it, it's so a company I say, that fits I, your... Yeah, so then I say, hey, uh, I don't know a darn thing about this, you know, but it looks pretty interesting. And uh, I'll say, okay, so send me your deck. Tell me what your thing is all about. And then I'll fling it off to somebody else. Uh, sometimes in, I do that. in the case it's not fit for you, it's not fit, not fits for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. If your, I don't know, your, your if I don't know the, yeah, if it's if it's something I don't understand, you know, I don't dare get involved with companies. I don't, I don't know, like a biotech company. 
I wouldn't know what the heck to do with anything Pass. like that, you know. So, yeah, so I'll just I'll but, pass but, that but on. you hear you're in contact with every company who wants to pitch you in, in, in your scope, in your, in your where the companies you use to invest. Uh, I'm sorry, what was um, that? That you, you don't pass away, you, you don't leave away the companies that are in your scope. That you, you right, right. For anything that, that I exactly. see that exactly. I think is, ve is worthwhile and I know that the product or service is going to work, exactly. yeah, then I'll, I will also bring in more investors and say, hey, what do you guys think? What do you want? Um, you know, I try to get other investors to analyze it and so forth, yeah, and attorneys even sometimes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, got a question right here. Um, if you can also talk a little bit about, um, you know, employees' equity sharing, you know, let's say if you're building a product, you're one year into it, you have done a lot of good job, you got a product up and running, you got some early adopters, uh, you even got some revenue coming in, mm -hmm. but now you're really taking it serious because you feel like, okay, it's really doing something, and now you want to go out there and maybe talk to some of your friends, bring them on board, but what kind of equity do you share with them? How do you come up with that percentage? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a, yeah, this is strictly, this is really more down the legal term, the legal, you need to, that's where your attorney, if he's a smart startup attorney or a business attorney, will be able to tell you how you split that up, right, what, because there are um, actually uh, quasi equations that they use, right, For like valuations, when they do valuations, they're actually using some algorithms sometimes to, to calculate that. Um, same thing with that. So if you've done all this stuff yourself, right, you, you own the IP and everything, the patent is under your name, well now you need to bring other people in. So then the companies or the investors, but it's not really the investors at this point. Right now it's your attorney. It's you and your attorney need to sit down with them and say, well your value is this, you can have, you get 5% of the company. Your value is this, you get 3% of the company, okay? There are different ways to gauge that and to look at that. And it all depends on, like if you're a company, you're gonna bring in a VP of business development, uh, that's three to 5% automatic. Um, if you're at that point that you're just launching and this person is really good, yeah, it's three to 5% for something like a VP of business development. If it's an engineer, um, if they're gonna bring in a whole new stack for you, that's gonna make this product really expand and do something really phenomenal that you don't have the technique or the technical skills for, uh, then that person's gonna get probably, you know, maybe 10% of the company, 10 to 20%. And again, you can start off with saying, okay, we're gonna first, we're gonna give you X amount, we're gonna give you 5%. But if you show along the way that you can actually, yeah, you're bringing more value to the company, we're gonna increase your, your shares, you know, you're, you can do that, that's, that's normal. Yes, if we're talking stock, he's talking about equity. He's talking about equity. No, you can also do it for equity. Equity is stock, right? It's... Oh, well, then he's not going to get any special anything else. I mean, he says, let's say we bring in a new engineer, and this engineer, you know, we're going to give you 5% off the top to start with. And if you perform and you do all these different things, we'll give you, a certain, you know, we'll give you up to 10%, up to 10 maybe. You know, I'm just making numbers up, right? So you look at what the value is that they bring in over a period of time. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Also, you need to give some maybe salary. Oh, yeah. sure, sure, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, but I'm just talking, we're just talking equity right now. I mean, okay. If he just wants to bring him in for equity or something like that and so forth, but like salary, so like you're going to do a VP of business development, you're going to bring him in. We're going to say, okay, we're only going to pay you $100,000. Um, but we're going to give you three to five percent of the company, that type of thing, uh, and then you do MBOs or you know you do. Could different be only civet, I mean, not salary one. Is it you know some people might say I don't want salary, but I could uh, be getting some percent shares. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's whatever the company is. I mean, you can do anything you want. There's no okay. law that okay. says you have to pay them salary plus equity, or you only have to pay them equity or anything like that. It's all up to the owner. It's up okay. to the owner of the company, the technology and everything. Yeah. Okay.
oh, sure, sure, you can, you can set that up and just say, okay, you're going to do sales, we're just going to pay you 10% of sales, you know, or, or a flat salary, you know, because um, there's a lot of startups, right, you don't have the cash to pay, or you may not even have equity to be able to distribute. This is something you sales understand and consider that. Um, and just say, hey, we're just going to bring you in, we want you to do business development for us for three years, and then say goodbye, and there's a lot of strange contracts like that, yeah. You can do anything you want. It's flexible, anything you want. There's no law that says you have to do it a certain way. Let's hear it for Tony. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Appreciate it. So, real quick question. I mean, is everything I spoke about here, is it understandable? Is it applicable? Is there anything I need to add or change, do you think? You, you guys like that. It was, it, was, it was worthwhile for you. Okay. So. I mean, I could, I could literally go on for a long time, you know, and stuff. And I'll explain some of these examples, too, after we get wrapped up here, if you guys want. So I want to present this to Tony. It's uh, an ideal right. IPO jacket. You can wear it when the weather cools off and when you work out. <laughs> I think you work out every day, right? So uh, let's hear it for Tony. All right. <laughs>